Uh, right now, we are moving to the second keynote, which is which will be made by Andrea, who I, I see is already uh, already present there. Andrea represents the Chamber of Commerce and, uh, and Industry of Slovenia, uh, and she works in the uh, Environmental Protection Department. Um, uh, let me just set up her presentation. Um, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you, okay. and I believe everyone else can also hear you. Um, just like a very quick reminder, uh, we have a question and answer session uh, after Andrea's presentation, but uh, and the question and answer session will be for uh, for all three first speakers, so it will be for uh, for both uh, Andre Bartomi and Andrea. Uh, if you have uh, any uh, questions that come into your mind, just write them uh, write them in the chat. You can do it now, uh, or you can do it later if you want. The chat is always open. Uh, okay, so with that out of the way, uh, Andrea, I invite you to uh, to uh, our virtual floor, and the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much. I'm so sorry not to be able to see all of you who are present at this uh, conference, uh, but I heard that around 90 people are attending, and I'm really happy to be here. I would like to thank Andre and all the organizers for the event and for inviting me to speak here. Um, for me, it's a great pleasure. So basically, I prepared a presentation on how Europe is going towards plastic packaging sustainability. As we heard today, Andre was talking about the sustainability and uh, how fancy this word might be. Uh, it sounds much better than it is uh, when it's put into action, I believe. It's a really difficult challenge, especially in the plastic packaging industry. And uh, I really hope that we will be on board all together, um, since I believe only in cooperation we can deal with waste. Um, when I'm presenting today, I'm wearing a really small sweater and I'm having a t-shirt underneath. And today it's almost 1st of November. My parents had a fur company. And most fur coats and jackets were sold just before the 1st of November because people wanted to present themselves in a beautiful way. And today I cannot even imagine to wear fur. It's too warm and obviously something is changing. Obviously we're sitting behind computers talking to each other. And I believe we are really living in challenging and difficult times. And I believe it's partly also our fault. So um, I think Europe is in a good way in the world to show how it's supposed to be done uh, but i'm afraid that it would need more in the implementing what it says that it needs to be done so uh during my presentation i would like to focus on the sustainability that plastic is going through the legislation put by europe uh, sustainability meaning less harm for environment better society and of course better economy um, so basically, let me just slowly start my presentation. So my name is Andrea Palatinos. I live in Ljubljana in Slovenia. Um, and since I can remember, I was interested in trash, in waste um, uh, problems. When I was three or four years old, I started picking trash from the streets when I was on my walk with my parents or with my grandmother. And uh, it's always been this fascinating stuff to me that we do this. Um, and somehow it didn't feel right. Um, so uh, shortly after I enrolled into College of Environmental Science, I encountered two of my biggest passions to combine. And those were waste and marine environment. I was very interested also in everything that was connected to marine. Uh, environment and it uh, these two com this combination came out as marine litter. Uh, back in 2007, when I started doing my diploma thesis on this issue, nobody was talking about marine litter in Europe. It was really a, a, a taboo th theme, especially in the science, because nobody wanted to make science out of trash. And somehow uh, it felt so good to be one of the first researcher on this topic. Um, and uh, after doing that, I enrolled heavily into marine litter and microplastic research. So basically, um, I was following around the beautiful Adriatic Sea and trying to uh, assess the amount, the quantity, the types of marine litter that were in the uh, Adriatic Sea and also other European seas. I had an opportunity to work also with French researchers, with 
other researchers throughout Europe. Uh, this photo I took on the island of Susak in 2010 is the only sandy island in uh, the Adriatic Sea. And I was fascinated by the fact how much of plastic bottles and polystyrene pieces were found on the beaches. They were just left there, nobody touched them. And uh, I was wondering, why don't we use them? I mean, my only thought back then was, why don't we burn them and keep us warm in the winter? Because Susak obviously doesn't have trees. But of course, it's not doable. Um, but in that time, I was thinking, how should we use this material so that it would be taken out of the environment and used in a good way? And I think that Europe is now on the good way to start reducing the amount of this waste that are, that are made and how to reuse them and how to recycle them and how to put into new life. Uh, shortly afterwards, in 2012, I was engaged uh, in a sailing expedition with French uh, researchers from Villefranche uh, Laboratoire. And uh, I led a, a research uh, on microplastics floating in the sea, in the Ligurian Sea. And here you can see a sample that we took on the way from Genoa to Corsica on the, an area that was not uh, land inside. And, and of course, nothing was seen on the, on the sea surface. But when we came up with the net, this is what we got into. So basically, we can see all so sorts of plastic pieces broken down, um, floating in the sea. Uh, and most probably, uh, many of them are sank and deposited on the seabed. But at that time, we were focusing only on the sea surface. And we can see that it was really disturbing that this is happening in the area where biggest whales and uh, dolphins and other marine mammals are feeding. This is a protected area for dolphin and whale uh, lives. And for me, it was really amazing to see all of this. Of course, um, I was I was very keen on researching it, but to be able to solve the problem, I decided to move from research uh, NGO. I established an NGO when I was studying, and from collaborating with ministry for a short time, I decided to do uh, work in business and commerce and industry. Uh, I believe this is the place where we can make biggest influence. Um, and of course, we, where we can, of course, also influence the consumers. Uh, so now I work at the Chamber of Commerce and Industry of Slovenia in Ljubljana, which is the biggest Slovenian uh, collaboration point of commerce and industry. Um, it serves uh, for companies to understand legislation, to be their voice in contact with the ministry, uh, to perform projects on uh, all sorts of Theme thematics. Myself, I'm more focused on circular economy and, of course, plastic waste and other types of waste. Um, so basically, Chamber of Commerce is uh, now approximately 140 employees, and myself, I work at the Environmental Protection Department. And speaking about marine litter and how it became obvious and how it became important to the European Commission, it all started in 2008 when the Marine Strategy Framework Directive was accepted. And uh, member states who had the sea had to assess the amount and the types of marine litter, including microplastics, on their beaches, sea surface, and seabed, and in the biota. And from that part, uh, from performing monitoring, uh, countries collected lots and lots of results. And uh, in the end, these top 10 items from European beaches came out, uh, which was a basis for later on accepted single-use plastic directive. The aim of the Marine Strategy for Framework Directive was to achieve good environmental status but, but, uh, for all European marine waters by 2020. We are now today in 2020, and it's far more than obvious that good environmental status is not achieved. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, recently, European Commission adopted uh, a threshold value for number of marine litter items bigger than uh, 2.5 centimeters on European beaches uh, should be less than around 20 items per 100 meters on average. 
in uh, Slovenia, we have the value of around 500 items per 100 meters. So you can see we are way, way above the levels that we should have. And I wrote uh, the red circle around the items that are somehow connected or are plastic packaging. And you can see that the drink bottles and caps and lids are number one item, which is surprisingly because in the Adriatic Sea and the Mediterranean Sea, the first item there is a cigarette butts. But this includes the amounts from the whole Europe. So if we combine those, the drink bottles are number one. Crease packets with wrappers are soft packaging that is included um, in uh, sugar foods like uh, uh, sweets or chips and stuff like that. Uh, plastic bags are also involved in the top 10 list, uh, drinking cups and cup lids and food containers. And uh, countries uh, based on these results made a list of measures how to improve the status. Uh, but of course, I believe the measures were accepted more like shooting in the dark and trying to hit something. Why? Because the identification of the sources of these items are really, really difficult. You have no idea where the drink bottles that is in the floating in the sea came from. Either was it through uh, from the ship, a fishing boat, a commercial boat, or a, a freight uh, boat. Either came from the beach where the tourists left it off, either came from the city where the citizen just threw it near the um, waste bin, or either it came from the city in the center of the country and flew uh, and float uh, to the sea through the river. So basically, we are in front of a really huge challenge of how to reduce the number of these litter items with measures that are based on pretty much around 50 to 60 percent litter items unidentified with the sources. But nevertheless, Europe is on the way. And last year in December, just shortly after the Ursula von der Leyen Commission swore in, European Green Deal was published. And to my understanding, <clears throat> it's a great, a great way forward. Basically, uh, Europe set its foot down in achieving the transition to circular economy, zero pollution Europe, and all the other themes uh, with which it will combine to achieve uh, climate neutrality and um, better life for Europe and uh, better life for environment. Um, the European Green Deal was um, shown as a growth strategy. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen said that uh, it's a growth that gives back more then it takes away. So basically, it's a really, really um, ambitious plan. But we need to shoot uh, for, this, uh, for the moon to, to end among the stars, right? So um, one of the things that European Green Deal also emphasizes is the complexity of the, Europe, of the environmental legislation and how important it is to implement the legislation that is now uh, valid and the policies that are relevant to European Green Deal are already accepted, they just need to be followed. Uh, and transition to a circular economy is one of the elements, really important elements of the European Green Deal. Uh, so basically, if we now step more into the plastic packaging world, we see that the uh, Green Deal is important for many aspects. Um, it proposes, the European Green Deal proposes new uh, circular economy action plan, which will help uh, modernize the EU's uh, economy and draw benefit from the opportunities of the circular economy domestically and globally. Um, <clears throat> it says for the first time, and we will hear this repeat in many times after uh, this uh, Green Deal, that all packaging in the European market has to be reusable or recyclable by 2030. Um, so basically, circular design for all products must be implemented. Uh, it will prioritize reducing and reusing materials. Uh, extended producer responsibility will be made stronger. Um, and the Commission will follow plastic strategy that was accepted one year before the Green Deal was accepted. So in basically 2018. Um, 
it will develop a regulatory framework for biodegradable and bio-based plastics, and it will implement measures to reduce single-use plastic. Um, and in this, the middle picture where you can see 100%, it means that it's made out of 100% uh, recycled PET. So basically, uh, Europe is on the way to minimize waste coming from industry. And it needs to boost the market of secondary raw material. It needs help, um, especially in nowadays times when the virgin materials, and especially oil, are so, so underpriced. Um, model for separate waste collection will be improved. Uh, Europe is acknowledging the fact that people still have difficulties separating waste correctly because in every country, the system might differ, and uh, also inside of the countries, systems might differ, which is really complicating, uh, complicated and not necessary. And one of the also important things is that EU should stop exporting its waste, plastic waste, uh, outside of the EU and should focus more on taking care of its own waste. This was shown uh, really well in the not long ago published article by our Irish researcher. Um, the lead author was Mr. Bishop, who assessed uh, how much of the polyethylene waste uh, exported from Europe uh, was ending as a, a marine litter. Uh, or enters the ocean, and they found out that in 2017, around 83,000 tons of exported polyethylene uh, became a marine litter. Um, this was based on the statistical data that was uh, online available online for free, um, and the researchers had many, um, uh, many, um, I, I would say, difficulties with finding out the sources of the waste and the traceability of the waste um, is that um, nevertheless uh, Europe shouldn't uh, export its own waste. Um, in line of, uh, as I said before, a circular economy action plan is one of the main pillars of the Green Deal and it was accepted or approved in March 2020. Uh, it's uh, basically having measures that will be put in place to reduce waste, uh, to, re uh, to uh, achieve well-functioning internal market for high-quality secondary raw material. It would present initiatives to establish a strong and coherent product policy framework that will make sustainable products more uh, uh, inviting, uh, and that no waste will be produced in the in the first place. Uh, this will be achieved uh, through opening and amending uh, established directives, and one of them is Eco Design Directive, which will be mm, broadened to products that are beyond energy-related products. Um, it will put in place that more recycled content will be uh, made. Um, uh, will be put into new products. It will in, uh, restrict single-use uh, plastic and it will counter premature obsolescence of uh, products. So basically Europe wants to have uh, <clears throat> uh, repair more um, uh, of products that will become obsolete and reuse them and then uh, recycle them in order to achieve reusability and recyclability of plastic packaging by 2030. Um, the packaging directive will also be open. Mm. So to reinforce the mandatory essential requirements for packaging mm, and which packaging will be basically allowed to put on the market by setting targets. Um, um, and uh, for instance, drinking water directive will also be uh, open in the as in line with the economy action plan to promote the use of tap water, and so to reduce the amount of uh, bottles to be uh, 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 used. Uh, it will propose mandatory requirements for recycled content develop policy framework on sourcing, labeling, and use of bio-based plastics, use of biodegradable or compostable plastics, 
and the EPR scheme, extended producer responsibility schemes, will be enhanced and with new waste reduction targets set. So basically, this is all in the plan. And now Europe needs to implement these plans through strategies and through uh, legislation, for instance, directives. And first of really important strategies in the uh, line uh, or in the, in the field of pa plastic packaging is, of course, plastic strategy. Uh, it's uh, one of the key commitments of the EU for actions uh, to design and produce plastic and plastic products uh, with full respect of the reuse, again, repair and recycling needs and to uh, attain more sustainable develop, uh, materials uh, developed and promoted. Um, uh, it also emphasizes again that all plastic packaging placed on the EU market is either reusable or recyclable by 2030 in a cost-efficient manner. And it adds to that goal that more that more than half of plastic waste generated in Europe is recycled by 2030. So basically, um, in order to um, in order to fulfill these demands, the plastic recycling capacity and sorting capacities in Europe will have to increase fourfold um, by 2030 in uh, comparison to 1215. And approximately 200,000 jobs will be made uh, when this will be implemented, spread all across Europe. Um, so basically, uh, plastic strategy makes the, the, the plan that was made in the new Green Deal and the circular economy plan even more um, concrete. Uh, so basically, it's, it wants to improve the economics and quality of recycling. It wants to improve the design um, where products will need to be made uh, uh, easier to recycle and it will need to, and they will need to have uh, more recyclable uh, material in them. Um, boosting demand for recycled plastic is also um, a very uh, prioritized and commission is committed to swiftly finalize the authorization procedures for over 100 safe recycling processes. The special attention is of course given to recycling of plastic that is in contact with food. And in order to be able to use them in the food plastics, um, Commission will approve these uh, processes. Uh, regarding better, a better separation um, and sorting of the uh, waste, as I said before, European Commission will uh, update the guidance on separate collection and sorting waste and make them harmonized throughout Europe. Um, the consumption uh, of um, plastic waste and the plastic waste littering is also on the, on the spot in plastic uh, strategy. And the Commission already started with their um, actions in 2015 when it adopted um, the revision of Plastic Packaging Waste Directive in order to cut the consumption of plastic bags, for instance. Um, the the overpackaging uh, is also viewed through uh, Plastic Packaging and Packaging Waste Directive and will also be made more stringent. Also, uh, biodegradability of plastics is nowadays a very popular term uh, that is mixed uh, with uh, all sorts of uh, terms used by industry and especially in the, in the public. It's really not clear exactly where products do the compose, how do they compose, how do they degrade, how do not degrade, and where should they put them and so. And the Commission says in Plastic Strategy that it will propose harmonized rules for defining and labeling compostable and biodegradable plastics. And it will also develop life cycle assessment to identify the conditions under which the use of biodegradable or compostable plastic is beneficial. As we can all imagine, not every product uh, should or could be uh, biodegradable. It's just not feasible or it's just not wish, uh, it's not just not our wish. But the problem with the 
biodegradability um, and uh, bioplastic is that uh, it needs to be made uh, biodegradable also in the environment, not only in the controlled um, environment in the uh, industry or home composting. And to attain all this, um, to achieve all these plans and strategies, uh, a lot of money will be needed. Uh, it's established that only for meeting ambitious goals to meet uh, plastic recycling, more than six, uh, between eight and 16 billion euros will be needed. And the um, uh, Commission is particularly attentive to uh, innovation on materials that fully biodegrade in seawater and freshwater, like I said just a few minutes ago. And it also wants to um, show health impacts of um, microplastics and develop better monitoring tools. I'm sorry, just maybe I'm taking too much breath in. <clears throat> Um, it's also very attentive to develop uh, alternative feedstocks in plastic production, especially on bio-based, since um, we all hear that and we all know that um, crops and uh, reusable, um, res uh, that are renewable sources to produce plastics are becoming more and more attractive. And plastic strategy just wants to make sure that um, <clears throat> they will be developed in a coherent and a standardized way. And the um, money that was going to be put into this project will come out of several sources. Uh, one of them is European Green Deal Core that is open by 26th of January 2020, which I also advise you to take a look at. Through uh, extended producer responsibility schemes that will be made broader and wider, are also expected to bring in uh, some sources for uh, product designs and, uh, uh, and better uh, reuse and recycling. Taxation is also in plan and uh, structure and investment funds together with uh, fund for strategic investment are also planned. <coughs> in 2018, a uh, European Commission opened and amended um, plastic package, a plastic uh, waste uh, package that included three directives. Directive uh, on the landfill of waste, directive of waste framework directive, and plastic packaging waste directive. Um, as the first one, uh, that was directive on the landfill of waste, and it basically said, that by um, 200, 2035, um, by 2030, waste to both for re uh, recycling or recovery recovery um, will not be allowed to be put on landfill. And by 2035, only 10% or less of the total amount of municipal waste uh, generated will be uh, allowed to be disposed of in landfills. Uh, this directive has some um, exceptions allowed, especially in member states where uh, more than 60% of municipal waste generated is landfill and, um, in 2013, and this delay is five years long. So basically, uh, landfilling is out, as we put it that way. Uh, the Waste Framework Directive was also amended in that package, um, and it stated that uh, preparation for reuse and the recycling of municipal waste shall be increase, increased. By 2025, a minimum of 55% by weight, and by uh, 2030, 60% by weight should be uh, prepared for reuse and of the recycling of municipal waste. Uh, general uh, minimum requirements for e extended producer responsibility scheme uh, were uh, set in the amended directive and uh, end of waste criteria were also um, more uh, specifically um, set. Um, the next important directive for packaging is, uh, of course, it's uh, packaging and packaging waste directive. Um, and basically, it was adopted in 1994 um, because it, it uh, set the, um, the rules 
what plastic is allowed, uh, what types of uh, materials are allowed, and how these materials should look like, what should they enhance. But now the, the packaging directive is becoming more of the directive to prevent uh, waste, um, uh, uh, waste production. Uh, for instance, in 2017, um, we know that only around um, uh, uh, 30% of plastic uh, waste uh, was recycled. Basically, around 40 to 42% was recycled. Uh, since there are new rules in the amended directive on how to report of the waste, um, the, new, uh, the new sentences is that only the packaging that is uh, going into recycling process will be uh, will be seen as recycled. These numbers will probably fall even more. I mean, um, in the end, it might be that around 30% of plastic packaging waste are uh, currently recycled in Europe. Um, the the directive um, made clear that uh, it was in 2015 amended to reduce the consumption of plastic uh, bags, what I already said, um, and it raised the bars on plastic packaging uh, recycling. Um, they, the plastic packaging recycling must be uh, made by member states so that uh, by uh, 2025, at least 50% of plastic packaging uh, put on the market must be recycled, and by 2030, this percent goes up even for 5%. We're talking about the weight percent and uh, the recycled percent. The amended directive also clarified the difference between packaging recoverable in the form of composting and biodegradable packaging waste, and it specified that oxodegradable plastic uh, packaging uh, that was previously thought as biodegrad biodegradable is not seen and considered as biodegradable packaging. Basically, oxodegradable plastics uh, had an added, has an additive that um, uh, starts the decomposing on the, in the faster way, but it only produces microplastic particles or particles of uh, products that are smaller, which is not biodegradation. The amended directive also states that by 2024, uh, EU countries should establish the extended producer responsibility scheme for uh, all packaging, and it's now mandatory. Until then, it was not mandatory, but I mean, most countries did use it, but now it's mandatory. Uh, producer responsibility scheme provides the financing uh, and uh, organization uh, of the return and the collection of uh, package of used packaging or packaging waste, and it's channel channeling to the most appropriate waste management option, as well as for reuse or recycling of the collected packaging. Uh, the very important change in this new directive is also how um, the uh, the quantities of recycled waste will be reported. And it says that um, uh, it says that in decision that was made at the EU level, as I said, the decision was that only uh, waste that enters recycling operation will be seen as um, recycled, or those ways that achieve end of waste status. That was uh, made clearer in the waste framework directive. Um, it also introduces changes to the formats for reporting, which makes which will make uh, traceability and um, the, 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 uh, the information on uh, um, following the waste streams more clear. And for the first time, it also takes into account the information on reusable packaging placed on the market and the number of rotations that packaging performs per year. So basically, uh, packaging directive is now uh, obligatory for member states. This July uh, was the date when all three amended direct directives needed to be impl implemented into national uh, legislation. 
and many countries are still having difficulties with implementing them. Um, last year in July, a uh, very famous single-use plastic directive, soup directive, was adopted. And its main aim is to reduce the impact of certain plastic products on the environment. Um, basically, as I said before, it was uh, based on the fact that uh, top 10 liter items found on beaches should be reduced. And um, it, it's a part of European strategy for plastics. Uh, besides single-use plastics uh, in packaging, it also follows the um, fishing litter uh, that needs to be uh, um, acknowledged. Um, to be clear on what single-use plastic products are, they are the products that are intended for um, uh, one use and um, are not uh, expected to be used many times. And uh, in commission uh, guidance that will be published uh, hopefully by the end of this year, it will be said exactly which products are part of the single-use plastic directive. Um, the definition also includes um, the part where plastic is supposed to be the majority of the product and where it uh, provides the functioning of the product. For instance, paper cups uh, without the plastic lining inside cannot function as normal drinking cups, so that's why they are included in the single-use plastic directive, because plastics makes them what they are. Um, and according to uh, single-use plastic directive, also biodegradable and bio-based plastics is included. That means that it's also in the uh, requirements. Um, and the requirements are to reduce the consumption of some products, to ban uh, the use of some products, uh, to, uh, to um, improve the collection of uh, separate collection of some products, including deposit return schemes, support, extreme support to the reusable solutions. Um, the plastic, uh, the, the soup directive, um, makes a really strong uh, emphasis on the fact that we should use reusable um, products instead of a single-use product made out of uh, wood or paper, for instance. Uh, it also, again, broadens the extended producer responsibility. Also, um, uh, burdens the producers with uh, costs uh, for um, for new uh, raising awareness and for cleanups. Uh, uh, producers will now have to pay also for uh, cleaning the litter in the environment according to single-use plastic directive. Um, so basically, um, the 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 separate collection of uh, plastic packaging is mandatory and increasing, as you can see in this slide. Uh, in 2001, it was only 15% mandatory, 2008, 2022.5%, 20, uh, and it's now increasing towards 50 and 55%, what was said in the Plastic Packaging Waste Directive. Additionally, single-use plastic directive um, added new targets for separate collection of beverage bottles, especially polyethylene bottles. 77% should be um, separately collected by 2025 and 90% by 2029. Um, and also in the single-use plastic directive, it says that uh, the new uh, bottles made out of uh, PET um, and uh, all other bottles should contain more um, of uh, recycled plastics in them. Um, by 2025, uh, um, an average for all PET, bot PET bottles should contain 25% of recycled PET. And by 2030, all plastic bottles, no matter from what materials they are made of, they should contain at least 30% of recycled plastics. And this is um, coming uh, to all state on the average. So basically, it's not, um, it's not easy to get there, I think. 
And one of the ways that the Commission is um, maybe suggesting or uh, would like uh, companies to do are uh, deposit return schemes or through targets, uh, setting targets in the existing extended producer responsibility scheme. Additionally, there is a really big fuss now uh, in the industry about the just recently uh, adopted uh, European Council decision on plastic packaging taxation, uh, which will help fund the recovery plan that is um, uh, European Union under now, uh, especially due to the corona crisis, uh, and it will basically tax non-recycled plastic packaging waste uh, from 1st of January 2021 onwards. Uh, and it will be calculated on the weight of non-recycled plastic packaging, uh, and for each uh, kilogram, uh, 80 centimes so or 80 uh, 0.8 euros uh, will be will have to be paid. And the mechanism to avoid an excessively regressive effect um, on national contributions will place limits on the amount uh, for less wealthy countries will have to pay. The levy will be paid annually by each member state and it will create, of course, a new burden for manufacturers placing packaged goods on the market because it will be based on, on the amount in weight of plastic placed on the market uh, and not on the uh, waste recycled. Uh, it's a prox it's uh, ex uh, ex expected um, that around 6 billion euros will be gained through this uh, taxation. And at, at, if we look upon how uh, information was got uh, from the old packaging directive, it was somehow foreseen uh, that around 42% of plastics was recycled. But now with the new and revised plastic and packaging waste directive, we will see full of this recycled uh, content to about 30%. And uh, these are the measure, these are the numbers from where uh, commission then got how much uh, money will come in uh, through this uh, through this measure. Um, so basically, um, this is also in line with the goal of recyclability of the new plastic packaging put on the market. By 2025, 50% should be recycled, and by 2030, 55% of the plastic packaging put on the market should be recycled. With this, the tax is will be lower. And somehow this should uh, somehow um, encourage states uh, to and producers to pay uh, less tax. Uh, so basically, I will now uh, finish with my presentation. I see that I was very uh, uh, fast, um, and um, I will be here for your questions. And um, I think that um, I. I was very, very um, honored by Andre to approach me to say this because I, coming from marine litter environment and now trying to work in the policy framework, I see that once you dig in, uh, you'll find yourself you're having a good time, as Lenny Kravitz said. And I think that um, what European Union is now in the process of achieving with all this legislation and all this stringent um, stringent targets uh, and measures, uh, it needs to be implemented. As I said before, um, the, the Green Deal and the, the uh, um, Circular Economy Action Plan already emphasized that the current legislation needs to be put in place. And when we will do that, it will be certainly become better uh, also for the environment. So thank you and um, I'm welcome I welcome you for any questions. Thank you so much. Uh, this was this was a brilliant, brilliant presentation. Maybe, uh, uh, a little bit over time, but I didn't want to uh, like uh, tell you anything because uh, uh, like the information that you provided there was was uh, I'm guessing. Okay, okay. I'm sorry. I just <laughs> and I thought I was too too short. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no, but it was. 
uh, it was perfect. It was really nice. Okay, so right now uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, if, if you have any questions, uh, I remind you to put them uh, to put them on a uh, on a chat on on our right hand side. I see we have two questions here. Uh, I've also included uh, Bartłomiej uh, and uh, also uh, Andre is very welcome to uh, to come and to uh, uh, try to uh, um, answer those questions. And those questions are like the first one concerns the uh, single use plastics directive. So you said that the bioplastics and biocomposites are currently included in the single use plastic yeah. directive. Uh, will there be, uh, this is the question from Chris, uh, when the bioplastics or biocomposites will be excluded from single use plastic directive? Are there any plans about excluding them actually? Or Yes, uh, I heard uh, the talk from, if I may reply. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, in the last version of the, the, the guidance document coming from European Commission, it was clearly stated that bio and uh, biocomposites are included and that they will not be excluded. And uh, I also heard a speech um, just like two weeks ago from a, uh, from a European Commission representative that also said that bioplastics will most probably be included since they see it as a big problem uh, for not having European uh, standard on uh, marine water and freshwater biodegradability. So basically they will put all the efforts into uh, developing new standards for plastic materials to biodegrade in the environment and after that it will probably get there to be excluded. But until now it looks like it will be included. Mm -hmm. Did I reply to that? Yeah, question? of course, of course. Uh, uh, do uh, any other speaker? You must understand that you must understand that the single-use plastic directive is aimed to reduce the marine litter environment um, pollution. So basically, bioplastics does not biodegrade it once in the marine environment. I mm -hmm. think that's the perspective that Commission is having here. From I mean, this point, yeah. Yeah, uh, like uh, I think that this is like an extremely complicated issue because uh, because of the lack of standards, as you said. Mm -hmm. And I've seen like many yeah. interesting presentation about uh, about the standards for uh, for uh, marine and freshwater uh, biodegradability and uh, compostability as well. Okay, uh, uh, any other speaker would like to chip in for for this answer, maybe? Okay, if not, we have another question, and this question concerns, uh, it's, it's a question from Aneta, and she asks, are there any studies concerning biocomposites from the life cycle assessment perspective? I'm not aware of them, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, I could look it up, I could uh, dig into this, and maybe uh, send Aneta a reply later in the week. That would be mm -hmm. no problem, but I'm not aware of them now. Okay, I see. I see. Uh, Bartwomi is up. Bartwomi, are you aware of any uh, LCAs uh, about uh, biocomposites? Maybe. Yeah, I just made a, a short research uh, in uh, places such as ResearchGate or uh, stuff like that, and I've seen that there are already some papers regarding this issue. It's of course a bit complicated in the terms of uh, the. <coughs> sorry. A, the product the, from which these uh, composites are made of, and B, for example, other outputs uh, needed, for example, the energy that is used for, uh, during the production, whether it's more fossil-based or renewables, it's, uh, it's also having an impact on the life cycle assessment. So it, of course, differs from a place to place, but from what I've seen that there are some studies showing that they have some uh, environmental uh, positives over over traditional fossil-based uh, plastics, for example. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And this is the question that I can actually answer myself uh, because uh, um, uh, I am actually involved in in in, in the life cycle assessment myself, and. Uh, we have even done life cycle assessment within this project. So yes, the answer is yes. There are some uh, studies which are which uh, uh, about biocomposites, like uh, specifically LCAs on biocomposites. And if you stick to uh, tomorrow, we will have a full presentation about results of uh, um, life cycle assessment for biocomposite packaging tomorrow. 
Uh, apart from that, uh, I also know that there are like many uh, studies already in existence. Uh, however, I'm not aware that there are many uh, life cycle assessment studies which are, um, so to say, independent. Most of them uh, were made by companies who are actually producing uh, the uh, product in mind. But yeah, uh, stick until tomorrow. Uh, we will have uh, like a full presentation on it uh, and some very interesting results about uh, the LCA of, of like one type of specific uh, biocomposite packaging. Uh, okay, and we have another question from, from Andrzej. And the question is, uh, do the bioplastics have a real chance to replace the ordinary plastics in the overall use? Who now? <laughs> uh, whoever wants to. <laughs> okay, I'll start and then Barton, may, maybe you can add it. Um, in my personal opinion, I think bioplastics have a good chance uh, in replacing some items on the market uh, that are, of course, um, suitable for that. And I think that um, it needs to be done in a proper way. Like we said, the, the, the standardization of the biodegradability should be set up. Um, the, the marking of these items should be set up. Uh, the, the system of, the man, of waste management that uh, will include these items should be also set up. Um, but I don't think it's a solution um, for the overall pack of plastic problem. Um, in my opinion, it's too expensive and um, maybe uh, not suitable for other uses. I mean, we cannot eliminate plastic with bioplastic, but we can eliminate plastic in some products. Thank you. Thank you. I may just add uh, shortly that uh, this is uh, we're returning here to the question of whether or not the uh, for what do we need plastics and this is the start from the perspective of circular economy and after that we can for example create economies of scale if the bio <coughs> sorry the biodegradable plastic for example having uh, common standards uh, could be developed and it's also important to bear in mind about uh, uh, about potential uh, negative uh, effects for which now we are not thinking about for example we remember a few years ago there was a discussion in the european unions uh, union regarding biofuels and the first edition of biofuels was supposed to be um, also environmentally friendly but it turned out that it uh, started to be a, a competition between crops used for fuels and crops used for uh, agricultural production and for food production so we when we create a bioeconomy we also have to keep the, those risks and challenges in mind and afterwards having them incorporated in the in the circular economy pattern we're uh, focusing on then we can create a bioeconomy that's fit for the future. If I can add to this, um, probably bioplastics uh, will not replace ordinary plastics in the short run, but in the long run, uh, that could indeed happen. And uh, it's not limited to biodegradable plastics, but more, let's say, bio-based, uh, non-degradable as well, just a direct replacement of what we have right now. Uh, and this will happen sort of like we're seeing the transition right now going from uh, fossil fuel um, powered vehicles to uh, hybrids and electric vehicles and so on. It's not that we will run out of the oil, but we will develop and push actually new technologies. Uh, but of course, as uh, Bartolomé uh, uh, said and showed, we have to be careful that of course we don't create other problems. And I think he also had a, a nice example of the project uh, in his presentation where it's explored how to use bio waste uh, from um, households uh, to make bioplastics. And I think it'll go in that direction because, but one point, I mean, when we talk about bioplastics, of course, we have to consider that bioplastics can be degradable or non-degradable, but that's a different issue. 
Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't see any more questions. I think people are longing for a break, uh, which was supposed to start 10 minutes ago. <laughs> but yeah, let's let's shift it a little bit. Let's be let's be flexible. Uh, let's have a break right now and let's have it. Uh, uh, let's have a uh, 15 minutes break as we planned. <laughs>